Hello, everybody. Uh, we are back here on Covidians and their solutions. And this is episode four with VoiceMed. So I hope everybody has had uh, a good summer or is still enjoying a good summer until now. But back here, we are going to assess this very exciting solution that uh, Taya, Cedric, and Yone, who will be joining us soon, will be talking about. Uh, now, to introduce VoiceMed, um, which is much of a superstar uh, after all the hackathons that it's been through. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, VoiceMed is, uh, as, you, <clears throat> as you've defined, a solution that enables the detection of COVID-19 through voice recognition and a few survey questions. Uh, you claim that the whole process takes up to two minutes. Uh, apart from that, uh, as I mentioned, you're much of a hack like hackathon superstar since you've been you've won uh, you've won first place at three three hackathons. Uh, yes, two actually. <laughs> two actually two, and you've been top finalists in uh, three more. Three more, yeah, yeah. Oh, two more. Okay, yeah. So uh, no, we're very excited uh, to to have you as your like these front runners of the hack the crisis movement. So I'd like it. I'd like us to to start as in, is this uh, is this definition of what VoiceMed is accurate, uh, the one I gave? Can we start with you, Cedric? Would you have something to add to this definition? Yeah. So I would I would describe VoiceMed uh, as a group of uh, twenty five people from more than ten countries, uh, and uh, those people are specialized in the artificial intelligence, medical research, and products. And and I think we are we we gather the. Uh, five months ago because we we had a common goal of building uh, this artificial intelligence and voice technology uh, not really to detect but what we call screening so basically it's the first step before detection and uh, we want to to make it scalable to to be able to uh, to uh, to to enable the detection of of billions of people uh, for COVID-19. Right. So, I mean, am I correct to understand that this is the, the using your solution won't give you uh, a diagnosis, but it's more like a, a pre-diagnosis? Uh, uh... Yeah. So, so basically, it's working. Uh, you can call from any phone number, uh, any phone. It doesn't need to be a smartphone. And then uh, we proceed to a test that is three steps test. So we are going to ask you to cough, to breathe deeply and to say a sentence and you receive a result if you have low, medium, or high risk to have COVID. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the whole process is, is two to three minutes, less than three minutes, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but if we, if we take a step back and we think of the very beginning, so you, Cedric, are in charge of product development uh, mm -hmm. at, at VoiceMed. Um, how, did you, how did you get about starting uh, this, this journey? I think a lot, of, a lot of people might be wondering how, <laughs> how, uh, how, does, how does this happen that, uh, you know, a solution that is uh, currently uh, able to do this, this, this pre-diagnostic uh, starts and starts remotely, uh, as, as I understand with it. So, so it's starting uh, uh, during Akaton. Uh, so uh, basically uh, there was this idea of, uh, of, uh, of providing uh, new ways of detection. Uh, because we knew that it was uh, COVID-19 was getting really big. Everybody was confined and there was all this initiative to actually uh, ideate on new ideas and, and, uh, and find solution to fight COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was the solution. And uh, by discussing with uh, more and more people, uh, machine learning uh, a specialist and the medical research specialist, uh, this, this common uh, idea of, uh, of, of finding uh, the solution through the voice and uh, we, we're starting with, uh, I think, a lot of uh, startups, let's say, uh, just a small idea during one weekend, trying to develop uh, an MVP or a proof of concept. And actually, we, we had something that worked. So uh, it was on the small, uh, small uh, part of the problem, of course. It was only on COF. And, uh, and, and in parallel to this, we were developing also a product that, uh, that would allow, allow you to actually do a phone call and uh, and do get an autom automated answer uh, about uh, having the, the COVID or no. Of course, it was just uh, theoretical or it was just a proof of concept. It was not working uh, at the time. Uh, but uh, since five months, we're refining the ID. And uh, yeah, I think, I think we're getting closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Cedric. We were just joined by... Um... Hello, guys. Hello, yeah. Hello, hello. Hello, guys. 
How are you? Uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're gonna cut a little bit on the small talk because we're already live. So uh, yeah. very welcome, <gasps> welcome to the to the to the show. Uh, so we we're just talking with Cedric um, about the beginnings um, before we get into the deep stuff of uh, you know just how how AI how AI uh, works for your solution and everything you can learn about speech. But so I mean we're still at the stage of understanding when when did you meet? Uh, like did did you all start at Hack for Italy? Uh, has most of the team been uh, been 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 assembling uh, throughout throughout the hackathons? How has this? Yeah. So so basically. Um... We it started at Ad for Crisis uh, Italy, and then during all the hackathons, we, we gathered to a really big group. Actually, uh, I think that the maximum was uh, 60 people in the initiative. Uh, of course, no one was uh, fully dedicated. It was just uh, a lot of people contributing, uh, sometimes in small part, and sometimes people were already uh, full time. And uh, and and during all those hackathons, we were like having more and more people, more specialized people. And I think right now that. Uh, a few months passed uh, since the first hackathon. We're trying to really structure and 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 be a startup. Before it was more uh, an initi initiative, kind of open source. You know, a lot of people joining and trying to add a small brick. And now it's more uh, um, trying to really structure as a startup. And and uh, actually, we're researching for fundings and uh, we're incorporating the company right now uh, to be more official. Let's say. How many people uh, are actively developing VoiceMed at the moment? So we are uh, between 20 to 25 people. Uh, I would say it's, uh, 10 people are, are full time and, and the rest are uh, something between uh, uh, 10 to 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and the goal for us, I think it's, it would be to, uh, uh, to, to have this uh, impulse, uh, let's say uh, investment impulse to uh, to be able to be all fully dedicated to to the mission and and actually accelerate the process of building the product mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i mean you mentioned from from 60 you've gone down to 2025 uh like the, 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 how 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 have the, these changes impacted uh the the development how is it like to to manage uh the, this amount of people and i'm assuming remotely right yeah so when you're 60 people and uh, and and some people are it's not really clear uh, uh, who is dedicated and who is not uh, who is going to contribute and for how long uh, it's kind of hard uh, in terms of managing the people because it's like okay uh, some people are coming that like, okay I want to contribute how can I contribute and then you kind of need to follow a lot of people uh, and people are going living because they have actually their uh, their own work their life and then and I think it was kind of a uh, natural that at one point some people were just leaving and some people were staying for uh, uh, the purpose of being there for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think the group that we have right now, it's, it's much more stable, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing much less uh, Akaton-like uh, events also, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's still a really good way to, uh, to gather more people and to, uh, to make some big steps. Uh, but I think the group of 25 people that we have right now, it's, it's really stable and uh, we can see the future with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, how aligned is it what you're doing uh, right now to, with, uh, with what you set out to do in the first place at the first hackathon? So I'm assuming, well, actually you tell me, what was the goal uh, of the very first uh, idea submission at Hack for Italy and what is it today? Is there a difference? Is it very much aligned? How does it uh, compare? Yeah, uh, my opinion. I think I was I was there in the first hackathon. Uh, so um, to me, the vision is it's it's clearer now, but the 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 path or the way is kind of the same. So I, I think it's really aligned on what we were starting to build at the beginning. We just have more knowledge and we did much more steps. Uh, but the the long term vision or or the the long term goal, it's it's to me, it's really clear that it's still the same. So. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I think we have this process of onboarding people and explaining what we want to do. And um, I, I believe that the, the people that we onboard four months ago or the people that we're onboarding right now, uh, we're kind of telling the same story. Uh, of course, it's refined uh, because we had time to think of it and, uh, and we made some progress in terms of product and in medical research. 
but but it's still the same message. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what I'm looking at here is what you set out to do. Was it uh, well? You set out with the feature of being able to donate your voice or answering a survey. What what came first? Uh, start yeah, from yeah. The, the first was donate your voice uh, because it's the it's the very first step of actually building the the technology. So mm -hmm. basically, the technology is is fueled by voice. It's fueled by sample that actually got uh, COVID nineteen. So this was the first goal, and it was the first step in terms of product. Let's say, how can we gather more voices? And as the moment we get, we we're starting to gather more voices, uh, the goal was more. Okay, now we need to build the technology, and with the technology, we need to provide it to the world. The first step was gathering data. So that's what happened during the first hackathon. And there is the second hackathon. It was okay. Now that we have data, we have more data and we can, have, we can start to build the technology. How can we provide it to the world? And this is where the, uh, what we call AVC, automated voice call, the technology that allow you to actually pass a phone call and, and, and actually make a test or at least uh, uh, make the first, uh, the first step of the, of the test. Mm -hmm. uh, like on that point, on the, 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 the well, voice donation, I'm going to um, bring it this, this over to Taya. Taya, uh, did, did you start out uh, at Hack for Italy? Sure. Actually, uh, I was not uh, officially part of a voice met like uh, during all this hackathon even, but I was um, indirectly uh, working with uh, uh, one of the uh, machine learning uh, researcher uh, in the voice met, like uh, her name is Deepa. So uh, we know, like, uh, as I said, like I studied in Sweden, that's how we know each other. So I was not first approached by Wisemed, but by this uh, friend of mine who is part of Wisemed. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that's what she approached me. Like she wanted some uh, some questions and something because my background is purely in uh, speech processing, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So she had some questions and doubts. So that's why I first got to know that the Wisemed exists and uh, I was so curious into that, so that I really showed some interest. And later, she asked me, like, would you part, be a part of VoiceMed? Mm -hmm. And I agreed, yeah, why not? Like, let's be part of this, uh, like, a really innovative solution that we are approaching. And uh, it's also, like, uh, what I do, like, for my career, like, uh, as a research, this yeah. is a side stream uh, that I need to investigate for some global cause. So I thought, okay, it's very interesting. That's why I got entered into this. One. I get to know all the results that happened with the hackathon and everything. But uh, as like not like Cedric mentioned, he was directly in the front face of uh, representing VoiceMate for all the hackathons. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I got integrated in uh, VoiceMate. Like from the beginning, like um, I mean, this uh, speech scientist in this uh, voice like VoiceMate R and D team who is working on uh, creating this tool, uh, doing research and uh, analyzing all the data set and uh, putting criteria what we can do and everything. Because uh, this is a very new thing, like uh, we need to do a lot of research today. So that's what we are doing right now. Yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds easy uh, from the side of, okay, you donate your voice and uh, basically you, <laughs> you build, you build uh, a, voice, uh, a voice recording feature, right? But I mean, we know that that's part of well, how, it, how the process works, right? It's like with, with uh, voice donation, uh, then that you, that, uh, follows or proceeds with a, a short survey that you take and the whole thing takes up to, to two minutes. But the key part, and this is what, what I'm interested in and what your friend or colleague uh, came, came to you with, is the algorithm, right? Yeah. So I mean, how, how are the, the issues the, uh, she had, um, well, uh, related to the actual problem of making uh, it work, make the algorithm uh, determine whether you could be uh, infected with COVID-19? Uh, the problem that she approached like during this hackathon time, uh, it's about like, uh, now the problem is much more difficult. Later we'll discuss that part, but like about the hackathon question, like um, we have some audio data for here it is nothing but the cough sound. Mm -hmm. So either it could be a normal cough or it could be from some other uh, uh, disease, like a uh, disease that is related to uh, your lungs or some bronchitis or something. There are varieties of cough that could exist. The one special variety that we are looking here is uh, COVID. And uh, so far, there is none of any research paper that really published so far to really say these are the key features or elements that you can see or find uh, in COVID cough. So all over like world, like all the leading research institutes and everyone, they are really in this race of finding why it is special. Is there any 
special acoustic differences that we notice in COVID. So, so far there is no significant feature that we can pinpoint. But on the other side, it doesn't mean we can't classify them. For example, I say the power that we have right now, it's like a, we have pretty much very powerful uh, deep neural network algorithms that, I mean, as a common naked ears or something, we can't really uh, differentiate all these subtle uh, differences. But for algorithm, it is so prominent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we need to feed some uh, valuable information to this algorithm so that they can work better. So it's a chain. So uh, the classification algorithm that I'm saying, it is about it has to say whether it has COVID or not. It's a binary choice. Mm -hmm. So, but before that process that we call very, uh, very essential and very crucial part that we call feature extraction or nothing but acoustic feature extraction. So you have a raw audio data that you record from, you're getting from either from your voice made web app, like from the people really donate their voice. It's a normal audio recording that anyone can really open and listen to and whatever it is. But what we do they hear is like, we really transform this normal audio recording into some uh, new domain called a frequency domain. Or people generally Sorry, call, call that. I didn't hear that. It's called a frequency domain. Like, uh, yeah, it's like, we can see all the frequency. Uh, mm -hmm. in that particular audio, or people simply call spectrum. Mm -hmm. So in the normal audio data, you can only see the just up and down running uh, uh, lines. Uh, it shows what time point that we call time domain signal. That's normal audio data. We can't see the frequency in that particular audio. Mm -hmm. So we transform this signal into frequency. Uh, you can visualize the frequency. In that particular one, you can imagine it's like an ocean. We have all the information, for example, like, let's say you just call, get a call from somebody, like you can say many things out of it without knowing that person. Like let's say you, he's from, could be this country, he's a male, he has call. You can really infer a lot of information from that. So like that, in that particular audio sample, you have all the information inside. So here we have to really focus or we need to find which feature is gonna really, gonna represent this COVID element. So mm -hmm. that's where we are really putting a lot of time in finding what feature actually helps us to uh, signify or to really say, okay, this feature is going to realize whether the person has COVID or not. So yeah. that particular acoustic feature extraction, actually the friend who approached me that she had problem because there is not some, just one frequency that just uh, one feature we can extract, but there are a lot of features that like infinity we can extract out of it. Mm -hmm. So there we need some uh, background in uh, speech protection, for example, how your uh, vocal tract works in human speech protection mechanism. So you need this little background to understand what could be the salient feature we can really try? Instead of trying all, we should have nar narrow down them into a list of features mm -hmm. so that it helps to really, instead of searching something, we need to narrow down because it's not speech, but it's a cough. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, uh, exactly. I think this is this. this uh, thank you for for elaborating on 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 the <laughs> aspect of the features and uh, and the intricacies of, of of doing this recognition specifically for COVID nineteen. But this is uh, the moment I'd like to bring in Yone as a medical doctor and as yeah. a medical affairs manager. Well, okay, you might you might uh, know how to deal with the technology. You might be assessing these these, these frequencies, but I mean, knowing exactly what you're looking for is what uh, is, the, is the other part of the challenge, right? And I think like the question I want to ask Yona is uh, at, the, at a time where the, the, the medical world was still um, struggling to, to, to understand just the variety of, of symptoms that COVID-19 presents and, you know, you, you find out one day, oh, actually it affects smell, it affects taste, it affects this, like, so understanding that range of symptoms, uh, did it uh, add impact also knowing what you could be looking for uh, in an audio, an audio track from someone coughing, uh, breathing, or speaking? Uh, corona is, uh, is being, a lot is being discovered. Um, uh, a lot of new information is coming in, and as well, we have to adapt. So basically right now, what we are doing is that we are being aware of all of this, and uh, we are collecting the needed data from the COVID patients, as well from the healthy people, and as well from people having different kinds of uh, pulmonary diseases, so that um, we can uh, collect a bigger, um, bigger um, approach and view of um, of basically what could be wrong, and uh, then then adopt our algorithm. So, um, so yeah, right now, uh, 
every 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 COVID patient has tiny bit different uh, symptoms. But um, as my colleague um, was telling you a little bit before, um, it is basically we have to find that one tiny piece in a in a in a speech recognition. So this is what we are focusing on. And all the other symptoms, they are playing a big role, but not the key role, um, at least so far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just but how much, uh, how much of this knowledge that, that you have uh, serve in informing early on how you needed to build the algorithm? So uh, algorithm is being built um, based on medical knowledge but uh, machine learners are uh, building it so um, we are as well having um, a professor in in who is specializing in speech recognition so um, he is providing with the key elements uh, the machine learner learning team uh, on the whole physiology and phenotype what they have to focus on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but Taya uh, how knowing uh, having this 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 medical knowledge, how do you go about pinpointing these features that you're looking for? I get it. Um, so it's so as I said, it's rather this information is rather from um, from the speech uh, recogni recognition uh, professors mm -hmm. and medical people. So for example, what I do, what's my role in, a, in, a, um, in voice is actually finding uh, hospitals and uh, finding collaborations with the research teams um, and informing um, the, the staff and doctors how we need this data, uh, what we need and um, basically collecting uh, the army, like the crew for us, uh, for the data collection, uh, voice recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, uh, what, what could you be looking for in someone's cough uh, that you wouldn't be looking for in someone's speech? What are the differences uh, between those, uh, those two audio tracks? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think maybe uh, uh, Tayaban can maybe answer this question mm -hmm. um, a bit better since he was already um, uh, working on, um, on on this algorithm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, I'll take over. So your question is like uh, in speech, uh, what we are looking for and from the cough, right? Uh, yeah, so we have, we have these audio tracks coming from breath, uh, breathing, okay. coming from speech, coming from uh, coughing, right? So what are you looking for in those in those three different audio tracks and what are what are the similarities and what are the differences uh, so uh, right now like uh, among the three one is a uh, cough uh, next one is speech next one is a uh, uh, breath pattern that we collect like we have uh, pretty much a uh, uh, promising results that is from cough uh, sound of these patients uh, that helps us to really uh, proceed forward but about speech and uh, breath, uh, still it is in more, uh, like I would say, research phase. Uh, still now, uh, we are trying to understand how it differs. For example, for speech, the person who, let's say, uh, the most prominent that, uh, like, we ask people to produce, like, a bubble sound, like, ah, uh, e, u, uh, such sounds. Mm -hmm. So for that, we already have, a, like, a lot of knowledge about how a normal person, uh, like, uh, produces ah, like a sustained bubble sound, like, ah, uh, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So here we need to uh, try to understand how it is, I mean, anyway, let's see if a patient like uh, donates their voice saying that I have COVID or something like that. So clearly we know this person has COVID. So the speech coming from that person, it's going to help us as a refer like a, a, like a data that we are going to find the differences from a healthy person. So that we have, we are really in a more research phase to trying to understand how this speech differs like uh, for example like maybe you lost your uh, breath like a uh, control like you can't produce uh, like a sustained vowel for so long time or uh, some rhythmic differences that could be there or maybe the intensity uh, sound that you put in that we call uh, voice quality it could be different so right now for speech and breath pattern we are trying to understand like it's more in a research phase like uh, even like uh, there is not even any single paper out so far who really says uh, in speech, uh, there is some difference in uh, COVID person speech, also verbal pattern. But people know because 
these are the things that's totally uh, closely related to your uh, speech production. When I call speech production, that the sound that you come out, it could be like a speech or cough or whatever it is. But it's more in a research space. But for cough, it's clearly uh, showing a prominent result uh, uh, for COVID detection. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, cough, the 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 cough and the shortness of breath have uh, have been these. Uh, um, well, these prominent, uh, these prominent um, features of our changes uh, due, due to COVID. Yeah. Now the voice is, is in the speech is, is something that is, seems to be quite, um, would you say that, well, am, I, am I right to think that it, it would be more subtle to, to spot something in speech rather than in a cough or a breath, knowing that uh, you know, you are likely to have shortness of breath, uh, and the, the cough will be also induced by 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 the conditions. Would you Would you agree? Uh, sure, I agree on that. For example, when we talk about speech, uh, it's getting much more complex. For example, generally we call speech is a very complex signal. As I already explained before, it has a lot of information apart from what you convey. When it comes to your speech, it has carries like a lot of other uh, information. For example, people's emotion, like whether He's speaking happily or sad or whatever. That's another element inside. Apart from that, he has a dialect, accent, language, and uh, he's, uh, a lot of other complex uh, elements comes in picture. So, so this makes it much more complex to identify. Like uh, about you know, on this, a lot of uh, big pool of information to identify where exactly this differs from a COVID. Like uh, it's a very complex problem. But still, like uh, I'm not saying that we can't do, but we need more research. To investigate for speech, but for cough, I would say it's more like involuntary action. Like if you want to cough, you cough. Like uh, you don't have any other complex pattern that you have in speech. For example, there is no emotion. Like cough is cough. Like you know, it's much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yes. So exactly. also, it's also comes like with more involuntary control. Like you can't control that much. Like you can't really cough happily or sadly, as I said. Like there is no dialect. It's more involuntary action. So it makes this. Uh, pretty uh, reliable uh, uh, sound uh, that comes out of your uh, like a production. So I would say this is here, that's a make much more difference. Like it's much, much uh, easier uh, for COVID, like uh, in my opinion, to go with cough, but at the same time, there will be some uh, features so far, as I said, we are in the research phase to investigate with the breath pattern, also with the speech, what are the differences for COVID for this, uh, patients? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but talking about uh, this this pre -di this pre diagnostic and later on a possible diagnosis. Uh, I mean, at the moment, someone starts the process with you. They answer questions about whether they are male or female. They uh, you know if they if they experience any headaches or any symptoms that we know about from COVID nineteen. And all in all, it's what about ten questions maximum. And then you go. You proceed to submitting a voice sample, a cough sample. And a breathe sample, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, breathing sample. Right. And the question, the question then is, uh, well, when when are you available to give this diagnostic? Is it immediately um, after that you are able to say, well, you know, this this it looks very likely from all this data that, that you've submitted that you have COVID nineteen. Please go get checked. Or does this take a while? How how does this work? What is, what is happening? It's uh, okay. We we have uh, we'll have uh, in the future different ways to actually do the test. Uh, as a, as I said at the beginning, we can, and that's probably the, the first one we're going to fully develop. Is the one that you can actually uh, do a phone call and uh, do this three step three three steps uh, test, and you will get a direct answer. It's like instant. As the moment the the, the technology is built to reach the technology and get a result, it's it's nearly instant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and but of course, then we want to give more information about um, about the next step for the person. Let's say that uh, it's a low risk, then it's fine. It's like okay, uh, just give you a few information, uh, clean your hands often, uh, wear a mask uh, in public places, uh, this kind of information. But if the risk is high, then we want uh, to give them more information, like uh, a phone number from the government, for example. It's like okay, reach this number because. Uh, you might have to do actually a PCR test and uh, you might have to do it uh, uh, quick. Uh, 
So this is this is the second step. So the result you get it directly, but then we want to to still give more information to the person. So actually, government can deal uh, much better with uh, with high risk people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at the moment uh, you have the two pilot studies going on with with hospitals, right? Yeah, yeah. is that still correct? Uh, maybe you, you know you can answer this. I can answer also, but maybe you you you'll be more accurate on this. Yeah, so right now we are having uh, two hospitals um, uh, collecting research for uh, for us, and as well we are on the go with uh, two more hospitals. Okay, but unfortunately the connection is not very clear again. But okay, uh, we seem to have confirmed that you have um, you have your pilot study. Uh, getting things right. That you seem to have your pilot study with two hospitals and with two more. So, I mean, the, the, the question is, at the moment, we're not talking yet about having this feature of calling a number and having this pre-diagnosis uh, from having a phone call, right? So, I mean, at the moment, the process is you record uh, your voice, your breath, your cough, you answer a few questions, whether it's on a phone or a computer, and then you might be given an assessment, right, from which you will inform your decision to to go to a hospital or not. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, it's 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 uh, it's not exactly this. Let's say that we have two different products. The first one is the product that you're describing. Is the one that allow you to record your voice. Mm -hmm. This one, it's uh, let's say it's the fuel for uh, the our machine learning team uh, to develop the the algorithm to actually make the test. This is the first product and this is the first one we developed actually during the Aqua Crisis Italy. Mm -hmm. But one we want to develop, we, we want to develop and we're actually developing it right now. And it's the, the one that's going to take us probably a few more months, uh, probably two, three months, is the one that allow you actually to do the test. The, the first one where you record your voice, it's a bit longer, it's like five to 10 minutes. But this one is just to the fuel to actually uh, build the models. <coughs> Sorry. And as the moment the models are uh, efficient enough and precise enough, then we have another product. It's just the phone call. You, 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 you make a phone call, you do the test, and in less than three minutes, you can actually get an instant result. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that for me. So what you're talking about uh, is the MVP that you were planning to, to launch at the end of October, well, which is uh, the, 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 the possibility to have this phone call and exactly. have this pre-diagnosis, right? Okay. I mean, and uh, okay, so you're, th this still takes me back to the question of you're gathering data. And in gathering data from what you currently have available, what's the threshold for having the accuracy you need to provide um, well, um, an accurate pre-diagnosis? Tayak, if we could have your, your take on, on this. What's the threshold here? So uh, the threshold is, uh, it's very difficult to define here. It's like uh, we are looking for a pretty much decent number. Uh, the references that we take is, um, there are uh, different uh, uh, research institutes around the world. They are working on it and they used to uh, uh, present an article uh, in this research forum. So that really gives us a precise, some approximate number. What is the accuracy of their uh, system that is they are developing? So we are comparing with that actually to know what, how far are we actually, what is our status in this uh, uh, research and uh, how we can improve it. The problem is after some time, let's say, uh, right now it's around approximately 86% uh, for cough detector and uh, around more than 92% for uh, uh, COVID classification. After that, the improvement is going to be very challenging. The reason I say is, uh, let's say a, per, uh, a person who has already some uh, uh, respiratory diseases mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they already have a cough, like a regular, uh, maybe uh, something, some, uh, uh, some problem. So if they like uh, get like uh, a diagnosis of COVID, uh, the way that they are going to cough is going to be a very complex problem because it is not just COVID, but it's already they have other problem within them. It could be uh, a dry cough that is coming from bronchitis or some other problem. So improving after that, like say we already kind of reach some uh, level of like say around more about ninety percent approximately, I can say that. So above that, it's going to be very challenging not only for us, like all over the world, because 
that area people who has like a kind of a mixed uh, other respiratory disease and everything is going to be very challenging for that we need more in depth research as like uh, also the, uh, in that case like the metadata will help us for example as cedric mentioned we are going to ask some set of details for the patient who are donating their voices right likewise all over the world people are really uh, collecting some data sets some are more open we can use that for our research purpose so some data, metadata going to help us saying that this person has post covid positive or something also he has some uh, other respiratory diseases those kind of audio sample is going to be very crucial and we will do some research in future to improve the overall performance of our uh, algorithm mm -hmm. so i would say uh, the threshold is like uh, now it's much more saturated but it's there is always a place to improve uh, because the, when we go more the problem is much more complex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, Cedric mentioned that uh, at the beginning, you were very much focused on gathering. Uh, so, I mean, would you say that at the moment you have enough to have the level of accuracy that you need, or you're still very much looking and con or, yeah, you're still very much looking to, to have more people donate voices to, 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 to better inform this algorithm? Where are you at? So right now, actually, uh, I would say we cross the level of uh, uh, that is in the development. I would say like uh, now we are in the phase of uh, testing and getting the numbers. So the numbers that we are getting from the algorithm is uh, much more very closer and sometimes it's a little higher than what actually people reported so far from uh, other places uh, in terms of their algorithm. Uh, right now, what we are actually also doing is the data that we are getting from uh, this uh, uh, web app. Uh, that we are using that as a test data. Anyway, uh, people already mentioned whether they have COVID or whatever it is, that we keep as a gold standard. And we are like feeding this uh, new coming data to our algorithm to know how our algorithm is performing on this new upcoming data. So this is it happening in this uh, research uh, uh, team itself. So uh, we cross the field that we could say like uh, it's almost ready to go or something like uh, that we need to discuss with other team, like how it works in the real time data. But COVID classification, I would say it's just uh, one block for us. But apart from that, we have another major issue is like uh, that is called a uh, cough detector. So for example, when you're like, uh, let's say a patient who's calling somewhere from a hospital. So we can't expect that particular patient's background is so like uh, quiet and uh, all these things. That is where uh, another major problem that we are facing. Uh, for example, there could be some music running in the background. As I already said, the speech sound, like the audio that we are getting is already complex by itself. Along with it, the background noise and the background crosstalk or the way that you keep your microphone to record this audio, this all adds up uh, and also it brings accuracy a bit down like because uh, this is all a very complex problem to remove. So that we should have some uh, block that we are designing, it's called cough detector. Independent of whether uh, it is COVID or if there is a cough, this algorithm should really cut those pieces saying that this is cough. Mm -hmm. So that we call it a normal cough director. It has no idea whether it's COVID or whatever it is. If it has idea only about it is a speech, it is a music, it is a cough. If it's a cough, this algorithm, the first block that I'm describing, it will take only this cough, it will feed to the next unit. So in this, as I said, like there's other set of, within a research team itself, we have a two to three small subgroup. One subgroup, they are really working on actually this cough director model. How do we really uh, remove or enhance these noises from this data that is coming inside? Because whatever the pre-processing that we do, it's going to later help us in terms of uh, feature extraction, then further to the classification of its COVID or not. So it's like a really, uh, like a, you can think of approximately three to four uh, major blocks in a chain. So they all have to, every unit, they have their own uh, problem and how good they are going to perform. It's going to help the next unit to uh, work much better. Mm -hmm. So we are really in the phase of really optimizing them. And also the data that we have right now, it's already across the level of uh, getting some sufficient uh, uh, prediction accuracy. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can just quickly complement yeah. on this. Uh, we, we are actually uh, uh, still act actively uh, searching for partnership uh, and, and data. Uh, but to pass the second step, the second step is uh, to gathering what we call certified data. So data that we collect in the, uh, let's say, uh, a compliant way in terms of medical and this is going to help us also to build models that are going to uh, to have a, a what we call the ce mark that is a stamp from the eu and as the moment we we have this then it's going to be much easier to go on the market 
-hmm. So uh, this is a step that we are actually building and that's why we're still really looking actively for, for partnership and, uh, and possibilities to gather those, uh, those certified data. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking about data and, and research, if Yona, if your connection hopefully allows for it, uh, fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> what, okay, it seems to be to be fine. Uh, what are you looking at with these two, two or four pilot studies uh, that you, you have going on? What is the goal with them? What are you expecting to have from them to for your MVP? So, as my team said, we are. Um, we are wanting to collect certified data. So um, we are um, we are recording then um, the cough, the speech, uh, the breathe um, in a in a complete silence. And um, so doctors are getting the instructions uh, how how they should record data for us. And uh, then we are as collecting the anamnesis from the patient so then we get uh, their diseases uh, um, like um, pulmonary diseases um, what kind of symptoms the patient have so um, it's like the whole brighter big picture of one patient that you get mm -hmm. And uh, right now, currently, we are uh, not specifying, okay, so we need a patient who would not have any smell or who would not have any of this or that. Right now, uh, we are lucky enough, it's a patient with corona, and then we get the full picture of it, and uh, then we can look deeper, and uh, then later on, maybe, when we have this certified data and we are lacking some kind of pieces, then we will start looking uh, towards the direction. But right now, we want to collect the whole bright, uh, big picture of every, every single uh, possibility of corona that's possible. Right, so you're, am I correct to assume that you're informing your research with people that have been diagnosed with corona? Exactly. Right, so, and you're, you're, you're matching that against the data that you've, that you've already collected from healthy people and people that could have potentially submitted, like given their voices, but without uh, a former diagnostic about having corona. So all, this, all of these stages, uh, they have to be um, run again um, from the hospital. Um, so we're gonna, so right now, if we are collecting um, data from COVID patients, we will need to collect the same data from non-COVID patients as well, so that we would just um, expand our uh, data picture uh, and get certified data. So how it, um, how it looks is basically we are having three groups. One group is corona patients. The second group is uh, patients with, that are completely healthy. And then the third group is a, comp is a comparison group. So uh, we are having another patient, like other patients with pulmonary diseases, and they are as well doing the same breathe, cough, um, and talk um, so that uh, we can compare um, their data with uh, corona, uh, corona patients. So there are three groups that we are as well needing um, a certified data for, if right. I uh, answered. Yeah, yeah, you did, you did. And, and, how do you, and how does data get certified? I'm assuming it's by medical experts, but what exactly does? Uh, so it's, it has to, it, has, it, is, it is a trial. So it's like a, a pilot study. And then, um, so, so um, imagine there is um, ethics committee that is deciding if there is a necessity to do this, um, this research or not. And if you're getting uh, approved by ethics committee, uh, you're getting the allowance to the patient's data. And this is basically what is describing it um, as getting medically certified data or not. Because right now when, for example, people are calling into our devices or going on the web page, they are agreeing um, to, um, to, to that we can use their data, but it's not officially like medically certified. So uh, it has to go through the ethics committee um, and being, uh, being done uh, basically in the research, um, uh, in, a, in a research center. Mm -hmm. To then be, to then, to then certify that, yes, this person is healthy or this person could have uh, a risk. Or yeah, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. right. Exactly, mm -hmm. because we cannot, for example, if, if, if you market uh, on a web page that, yes, I have Corona, nobody knows if you really have Corona or you're just coming and saying that you're having Corona. Um, for example, in, in the hospital, it's already, it's already known and it's checked that, yes, you do have this, uh, you, have, you, you have this diagnose, and now we are um, collecting the data on this diagnose that you have. Mm -hmm. So this is what is giving the certification for the data. Right. That's reliable. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's uh, quite impressive. And I mean, the, my question now is, once you have your MVP and the, 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 the idea is to have people call in and go through the process and be given an assessment, how much time do you think that will take and how quickly are you able to give an assessment while someone is on the phone? Or would this be outside of the phone uh, call? Yes, it would, it, the, 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 all the point of it is to, uh, to give the, the answer directly on the phone. Directly. The whole process between the beginning of the, the, the phone call and, and the, actually the answer uh, of the test, uh, low, medium, high, uh, all the process is three minutes and everything is, is uh, regarding one phone call. Mm -hmm. Right. And now what if someone is in the, indeed flagged as, well, you present uh, a, high, um, a high likelihood of having Corona. The person assuming that the person like takes it seriously and goes to the hospital. How much uh, work do you think are you're saving for someone in a hospital? Like would, it, would uh, doctors that in a hospital integrate or have a chance of integrating the pre-diagnostic that this patient was given or they would, they would, uh, or not, they would just. Yeah. On, the, on, the short, on the short term, our goal is naturally to integrate with uh, hospitals. Uh, it's more to work directly with the governments uh, because they have the, 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 they have the power to actually uh, uh, put us in contact with a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of people, uh, probably all their population. And uh, also to make this contact with uh, uh, the hospitals or the medical uh, research centers. Uh, when you need to treat uh, someone that is high risk. Uh, what we provide is providing the technology and providing the result of the technology. And then the whole strategy it's, it's more uh, uh, will be an help for governments. We're not going to be the ones actually uh, um, helping after the people or saying to someone, okay, you need to actually go uh, to do a PCR test or to go to the hospital. And that's why we want to work really closely with government because we believe that uh, if we want to go fast, we, as a startup, uh, as VoiceMed, we need to uh, develop pretty quick the technology and to uh, provide it to the one that actually need it. And the one that really need it right now are the, the governments. Right, but I mean, you inform the government, but where does the, the patient stand there? I mean, does the patient then, okay, knows that there's a high likelihood and they go or they don't go to the hospital and you kind of lose track or there's yeah. no information so, being passed on to doctors and the time <laughs> you will inform the government that you, there is a, a potential case there? Exactly. That's what we want to do. It's basically working with government. Let's say that uh, we provide uh, uh, 1 million tests or 10 million tests uh, to have an identifier for each test. And then the government can actually give it to the population. And then uh, they have something, probably a dashboard or something like this, where they can follow who did the test, who did not, and what was the result of the test. This is what we want to provide because we really believe that we, we will never on the short term have the, the poor force to actually uh, make the people go to the hospital or do a test and also to make the link between all the, the hospitals and, and the people. Mm -hmm. So I think what, what we're thinking is that the, the easiest way for us is actually working with um, governments or really big companies uh, like uh, screening companies or diagnostic companies mm -hmm. uh, to actually give them the technology. That's, that's our goal on the short term. Right, right. So no, no, like that, that, that's an important point to understand. So, but I mean, thinking of if I would be flagged as someone with a high, with, uh, high risk of having Corona and, you know, I want to go to a hospital, but I understand it's high exposure and actually also want to save some time to the doctors and say, you know what, I've already been questioned as to whether I have pre-existing condition, this and that, like all of these things. Uh, well, I cannot really do it, right? Because it's like they, I, I'm going to have to repeat everything. They're going to have to to trust that I'm saying the truth. So in the end, it, this this wouldn't really be speeding up any particular process because they would just have to, to, yeah. to start so, from scratch. Uh, 
I can take an example. Let's say I'll take Luxembourg. Uh, so it's uh, uh, 650,000 people. Uh, if I take all the people that cross the frontier to come to work, let's say it's 1 million people. So the point of uh, VoiceMed is doing this screening that we, we discussed at the beginning. So basically I can make the 1 million people do the test in a really short amount of time, probably one, two or three days. Mm -hmm. And, and with this test, I can screen all the population and I can say, okay, 90% of your population, it's a low risk. So you should focus on those 10% that are medium or high risk. And this is where we make the government and the hospital gain a lot of time actually, because if I take the number of tests that are made in Luxembourg right now, it's six to 10,000 tests per day. So it means if I want to test actually all the population, it's half a year. And Luxembourg is probably one of the, <laughs> the best students let's say, if I take uh, Germany or uh, if I take Belgium and France, it's, it's 20, 20 times the time uh, to actually do what Luxembourg is doing. So it means that I would need five years to actually test everybody one time. Mm -hmm. So they need to actually speed up the, the, the process of screening. And what we would provide is this screening. So basically I can say 90 or 95 population, 90, 90 or 95 percent of your population is safe or it seems safe but you should focus on the five to 10% that are the more at risk. And then you make the process going really fast because to, to, to test five or 10% of the population, maybe it's taking me, I don't know, two weeks or one month. Mm -hmm. And then I'm much more accurate. If, if I take the accuracy of the test in Luxembourg right now, it's six to 10,000 uh, um, tests a day. And, and regarding all those people, there is like 0.2% that are infected. So it means that we are not really aiming that good to the people that actually are infected. Right. I mean, the, the, the question is, well, right, you want to help the government focus on a particular um, percentage of the population, but how, how can the government go about focusing after you've given them the data? What, what happens with that uh, information? So, so basically, uh, what we want to do is to work with them and uh, they will have the, all the population. Uh, we would probably, uh, this is just an idea we need to, to figure out with governments, but uh, to give a specific uh, code to each person. So you could, you could follow who did the test and who did not. Uh -huh. And you could also have the result of it. And then the government could say, okay, there is those 10,000 people that got high risk in the pre-screening test of VoiceMed. I should focus on them. I should maybe call them. I should give them, uh, send them a mail uh, to actually push them to do the test. Or I could say to them, oh, it's better if you stay 14 days at home. Right, right, okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's clear. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm just uh, getting aware that we're, we're reaching the, the end of our yeah, lovely podcast, uh, webinar that got a little bit rocked with not being live streamed for a while. We're really sorry about that. We'll, we'll make amends. It's, it's been recorded since the beginning on our um, cloud system. So anyway, that's just to rectify. But my, question, my, my conclusion here is that indeed we can learn a lot from voice, cough, and breath. Like, I think we've established that. And the, and the question is, well, where next? I mean, where next for uh, VoiceMed after launching this MVP with what you're already doing, uh, but also where next for, for healthcare as a whole with the range of possibilities made available by being able to infer so much information from voice breath and cough. Um, so yeah, so basically the, the, let's say the actual for us, it's really, uh, we are really in the process of, uh, of raising money. Uh, we actually need to, uh, to, to, to speed up the, the process of development. And uh, so for this, we need uh, to be able to, to have uh, 15 people working full time on the, on the product. So product and machine learning. Uh, so we're really actively searching for this right now. And the second step for us, uh, we, let's say we have uh, right now two steps. The first step is uh, fighting COVID-19. And as the moment COVID-19 is finished, then our next step would be to follow, to, to focus on all the Lyme diseases. So to keep what we built and to improve it, to be able to detect all the Lyme diseases. And probably the first one would be Lyme cancer. That is one of the deadliest uh, cancer. And, and then the second part is to, would be to uh, to put it to all the the uh, degenerated de uh, uh, brain degeneration uh, diseases. Uh, for example, uh, there are already studies about Parkinson uh, that uh, that through the voice uh, be uh, able to detect it early. And we know on this kind of diseases, the key is to detect it early. We know that at one point, in the same for cancers, at one point, if 
if you dedicate it too late, it's kind of a, a palliative, but it's not really uh, trying to solve it anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yon, uh, can can we get your take on just well for what Cedric said about the uh, growth and pivoting uh, curve of voice med and also of the possibilities made uh, available by voice, um, breath, and cough recognition for healthcare? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, what what Cedric uh, said, it has been really uh, research done on it, and um, there is just uh, some time more research needed um, to, to, to start developing the product. Um, generally, what is um, what is really overwhelming and crazy is that we are really right now entering digital health times, mm -hmm. where um, uh, doctors are starting already to consult um, with the telemedicine and I really see voice med as well being implemented in um, you know as a, as a, as a health tech um, um, solution for various telehealth um, companies as well so it's like um, we're gonna be able to like imagine we will be able to distinguish um, all kinds of um, diseases from the voice of course it's not going to be every single uh, um, it's not going to be a lot of the diseases but um, I think with the pulmonary diseases since we already started gathering the data and and so on um, we're going to be um, a device if, if we are lucky enough we work hard enough um, we're going to be maybe eventually even used uh, by doctors as well so um, it's, it's, it's a big vision and as, as, as well seeing where the life is going, um, where, how, how, how everything is changing, how everything is digitalizing. Um, this is how I as well see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, in this, in this, um, in, in, in pivoting to, 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 to turn to other diseases once, uh, well, once we get COVID under control, <laughs> uh, yes. it, like the, would the idea be to turn more to patient hospital uh, relationship or still keep the government very much in the loop and being like the primary, uh, the primary receiver of the, the data you gather? I think it just depends a lot how, how the turns are going to be. Uh, so first of all, right now, of course, uh, this is Corona and this is the government time. Uh, after this is being dealt with and pandemic is over, uh, we don't know if um, governments, um, it's like I have, like personally, I, um, there, there are some, for example, um, prophylactics, you know, uh, against uh, cervix cancers, around um, against COVID cancers. So who knows, maybe it's going to be possible to, pitch um, this for the government as well as a prophylactic tool as uh, when we have it, uh, when we have um, a device for uh, lung cancer, for example. So um, this one is not going to be, for example, taken by your blood. We're not going to take uh, measures of by the blood, but we're going to be just uh, talking and coughing to the, to the microphone, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, this, this could be an option, but I think for the later um, perspectives, uh, it's very likely that we're gonna as well more focus on the hospitals um, and, uh, um, and 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 get as well there. So it's just uh, you know where you're going. It a lot depends on um, on like later stages. So right now we are very much focusing on on Corona and we are having this vision, but uh, we haven't been concreting it uh, so deeply yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the one of the one of the things also that we, we we thought of and uh, um, and that we will work on in the future, it's really providing uh, finding ways to provide the technology to uh, to more companies or to more uh, uh, um, like to to the, to the health in general. So uh, there is ways to do it, and actually uh, one of the ways to become a third party. So basically, it's providing your technology through APIs for other companies to actually use it, for hospitals to use it, for uh, a doctor to use it or to be integrated in his everyday software. So this is one of the, the ideas that we have because we really believe that the technology, we, we have a, a few ways to think of how to use it. But if we make it at a third party, then you probably going to have a lot of people that got other ideas to actually how to use it. And this is where you get the full potential of your ID. So 
that's that's one of the big ideas that we have also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on a, on a bit of a conclusive note, I wanted to, to ask Taya here on the importance of uh, working with deep neural networks when it comes to uh, acoustic analysis versus having this single or multi-parameter um, analysis of the uh, audio. Uh, yeah, as you said, like uh, with this algorithm, that is totally the computer science development with this also this modern uh, processing capacity of all the smartphone or the website that we browse, the speed of internet, what we have, it's all really supports uh, for this kind of high uh, powerful computational algorithms to really run in a very short time. Uh, on the other side, likewise, uh, the major demand right now is about uh, the data. That's like for example, like people really clearly describe, like we can later look for some other diseases and everything, but here all the data plays a very major role uh, on like how the algorithm is gonna perform. Like an algorithm, I would say it's more mathematics. Like it's a little bit, it's under your control uh, uh, that you can really work on and uh, you can really adapt some algorithms from any renowned university who published. That's really a lot of working on there. But data and the partnership is what, what really makes us to really uh, take a big leap uh, to finding all these things. As I said, this is a very uh, great advantage what we have uh, right now uh, in this uh, modern age, like uh, all this, uh, as you said, like a deep neural network algorithms and everything. About acoustic feature, the direction that uh, the whole field is moving is, right now we do, it's called hand-picked features. For example, we need to define uh, what acoustic feature the algorithm should use and everything. On the other side, there is a new uh, trend of like uh, people doing some investigation, also some research about, we just feed some raw audio data and we just define it has COVID. So later the deep neural network algorithm itself gonna take uh, control on what feature is going to extract. It's not anymore uh, human defined. It's more like we call the name of auto encoder. So the algorithm itself uh, gonna extract some information that it feel it really uh, helps uh, the further process. Uh, that kind of approach is also people really putting more uh, work in there. So soon maybe we'll uh, reach that phase. Like uh, it's no more like a human defined acoustic feature. What we really think it is, it's going to be soon uh, algorithm will pick by itself what uh, elements are really essential uh, to predict uh, uh, this COVID or whatever the disease, like a, a, a respiratory disease that we discussed. Mm -hmm. So that's the direction this, uh, uh, like the whole field is moving. Right. Right. I mean, I, I just, I'm really trying hard to, to stop this discussion, but there's just so much to ask. And, and but my question is relates to, for instance, we know that uh, psychosis. Uh, there's, 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 there is a way to uh, determine if somebody can uh, have has psychosis or not by a voice recognition. I mean, do you, I know that you're, you're you, well, as Yone just said, and, and Cedric as well, you're looking at lung diseases at, uh, at first because you have so much data. But I mean, imagining that you're going to enter the field of well, neurological diseases and, you know, being able yeah. to diagnose early on schizophrenia or um, other forms of, of psychosis, how would you then calibrate um, the, your, your search to identify things in these audio tracks of all this data that you have that wasn't necessarily profiled to spot someone with psychosis to then use it for um, diagnosis of psychosis against people that you know have uh, been diagnosed with um, psychosis. Do you think it's possible that then we use all this data for other um, other diseases? I mean, am I making sense here? <laughs> Sorry if it was a, a bit confusing. Um, I kind of yes and no. The reason like, um, for example, like a major part, like the investigation that we do with the COVID, it's, it's totally different from uh, like, if you talk about this, a central nervous system related disease, or like, uh, uh, for example, major is uh, with COVID and everything, the people, they have a problem in uh, lungs and everything. So that is uh, one of the uh, important organs that is involved in your speech production. Um, but when you talk about this, uh, like uh, neural disorders, the problem is totally different. For example, the brain is the one which controls all your uh, articulatory uh, organs through the motor nerves. Mm -hmm. So uh, the problem is you have organ, everything you have working fine, but the problem is how your brain is really losing its efficiency to control all these things. So the way that we approach here, it's totally different from how we are gonna address this uh, uh, central nervous system related uh, problem. 
mm. they are more is about people lose like they really they can't pronounce any words properly it's like more uh, like uh, you can think it's more intellectual uh, kind of thing people have problem in uh, speaking continuously they lose some uh, complex words uh, like a tongue twisters they can't produce it because you don't have this fine control of this articulator uh, that you normally like a healthy person who has they can really produce but as i said like uh, the pipeline could be the same uh, like uh, we have a feature extraction then the classifier then noise removal and everything but we will totally take the different approach but the data that we have it's going to uh, play a very vital role we can do many investigation on that like all uh, people already said the primary goal is to really uh, focus towards uh, uh, covid after that the data is there it has like also people mentioned they have some other this is something we have metadata that says there are maybe some day people have some other uh, uh, diseases as well so that also going to help us later to really uh, investigate more on that subgroup of data like what are the differences people have and everything something we can do a cross uh, uh, disease related of study for example when covid uh, like uh, people who have other respiratory diseases when they get covid how their sound is going to be like that so this kind of a complex study that we can do with this kind of a valuable data Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that we can all uh, these are different segment of knowledge later we can really put all them together into a proper uh, big uh, product that can have a, like almost a big global knowledge about all the uh, a possible uh, disease that could be identified uh, uh, from your speech or from your cough or from your breath mm-hmm. along with that also right now we are really doing some other investigation it's called longitudinal study for example uh, if a uh, a person who has a normal a healthy voice they can uh, uh, donate their voice like that uh, every day they are donating at let's say if a person who really donated their voice saying that they have covid and also if they donate their voice like after covid like when they really get cured and everything that also going to help us like how what are the difference actually it happened when they really got cured from covid mm-hmm. so like this it's called longitudinal data like selecting one particular person and studying their whole uh, timeline like before covid in covid and after covid it's mm-hmm. going to really give us a very deep knowledge about how this actually develops maybe later at some point we can even say okay this person is actually it's at this stage of covid so this is kind of a longitudinal study we can really uh, do in later stage with this kind of a data what we are collecting mm-hmm. also as i said like uh, this is we are always welcome with like more partnership and everything that actually increases the time that we are waiting for the data fascinating to me and i hope it was fascinating to the audience uh, to thank you so much uh, team voicemed and uh, yeah. congratulations on on your solution i wish you all the best uh, and you know hopefully you know we we'll might talk soon about new developments um, i certainly wish for it to go um, the best way it can so go team and um thank you for this thank you very much thank you thank you so much bye bye, bye. bye.